Thank you for the opportunity to give this talk at this important event celebrating 100 years of insulin therapy. This work is a collaboration between three individuals at three different institutes led by Dr Ewan Brown at Heriot Watt University. I'm Shireen Forbes, I'm lead physician for the Islet Transplant Programme for Scotland and I'm based at the University of Edinburgh and Professor John Campbell at the Scottish National Blood Transfusion Service. And this work is examining islet quality in the assessment for islet transplantation in people with type 1 diabetes. Now, diabetes is diagnosed by high blood glucose levels and the classification and diagnosis is by strict blood glucose levels as seen here, defined by the World Health Organization. And the term diabetes was introduced by the Greek and it means to siphon, which refers to the excessive urination seen in the condition. And mellitus comes from the Latin word, which means sweet like honey. And there's two main types of diabetes and this uh, talk is really just concerning type 1 diabetes, which is the more rare form of diabetes. But I also mention here type 2 diabetes, which is the more common form, which is seen in people who are overweight and much older. But type 1 diabetes is due to the destruction of insulin secreting cells, the beta cells in the islets of Langerhans, which is in the pancreas. And it's characterized by deficiency, or at least near deficiency even, of insulin production. People are often young at diagnosis and they are rarely overweight. And insulin remains one of the most significant discoveries in medicine, discovered in 1921 and first commercial insulin was produced in 1922. And you can see here the four individuals who were involved with the discovery and who were given the Nobel Prize in medicine in 1923, Banting, Best, Collip and McLeod. And whereas before people really couldn't live with their diabetes, mean life expectancy was anything from one to three years, um, if that post-diagnosis, after insulin was discovered, people could obviously live with this condition. So it was a remarkable drug and still is. But there are challenges with blood glucose control in type 1 diabetes when people are on this uh, therapy which is injected. It does not of course mimic insulin release from the pancreas. So here we can see a typical blood glucose profile of, of a person without type 1 diabetes. You can see it's in this green range between the levels of about 4 to 8 and very tightly controlled whether people are eating or not eating. In contrast, somebody with type 1 diabetes can be prone to big swings in their blood glucose control. Not always, but sometimes. And here you can see somebody experiencing hypoglycemia or low blood glucose readings below 4. And here you can see them also experiencing high blood glucose readings. Um, and it can be incredibly difficult to predict insulin requirements, what with exercise and food and hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia are common. Severe hypoglycemia is defined as a low plasma glucose requiring help and it occurs in around 30% of people with type 1 diabetes and Diabetes UK have been instrumental in really putting forward that people should be alerted to going low when their blood glucose comes to 4 millimoles per litre. In somebody who's been recently diagnosed with type 1 diabetes who takes too much insulin for their requirements and develops hypoglycemia, 
they can get signs and symptoms of this hypoglycemia. They feel shaky, dizzy, sweaty. But if they experience repeated hypos over a period of time, this can lead to reduced or no awareness of their hypoglycemia, and this can be dangerous. The symptoms and signs of hypoglycemia may improve if these hypos are eliminated, but that can be tricky. You can see here, insulin and glucagon is produced in a healthy um, individual without diabetes. It's produced by the islets of Langhans in the pancreas and it controls the blood glucose levels incredibly tightly. So you can see here, blood glucose levels of between four and eight. Now, there is a procedure called islet transplantation where islets are extracted from the pancreas of a deceased donor and they're implanted into the liver of an adult with type 1 diabetes. And this can really lead to stabilization of blood glucose levels, and it can be a life-changing and life-saving therapy, in particular in those with severe hypoglycemia. And this paper from the group in Edmonton really changed the way in which we thought about the treatment of type 1 diabetes. The people in Edmonton achieved insulin independence in seven people with type 1 diabetes following islet transplantation. And this set in motion many other islet transplant programs all over the world. So here you can see that um, Europe really leads the way with a huge amount of activity in the UK and in North America, most transplants have been done in people in uh, Edmonton in Alberta in Canada. And the procedure itself involves the following. A human donor pancreas from a deceased donor is taken to the lab. It's injected with enzymes which digest the pancreas. Islets are then purified. And this bag is basically sent to the radiology suite. The patient goes to the radiology suite. They're sedated. The main vein to the liver is localized under radiological guidance and the islets are attached to this um, tubing and the islets are simply infused under gravity into the liver and this whole procedure takes around 30 minutes. And in our program, we have transplanted 122 uh, transplants in 66 people. And so you can see that the majority of people require two transplants. And over 90% of our people that have been transplanted are, um, still have uh, grafts which produce insulin. So there are much reduced doses of insulin that they take under the skin. And the benefits are mainly the reduction in hypos that comes out of them being transplanted and an improved awareness of their hypos as well. So this is um, just outcomes seen a year after transplant. And so the benefits are this um, reduction in hypos, which can last many, many years. So at five years, 60% of people still have this reduction. They have improved glucose control, but you can see here that freedom from insulin injections is low. The main risks are related to taking the anti-rejection drugs, and that's the risk of skin cancer, which um, at six years is 8%, and other cancers as well. And in, the infection risk is also much higher, but you can see the complications of the procedure itself um, are very, very low. Now, the pancreas is a scarce resource, however, that does not meet, meet demands. And you can see here 
that of the pancreases retrieved, only 11% are actually used for uh, transplantation purposes, be it isolation and transplantation or as part of a pancreas kidney transplant. Unfortunately, because the availability of pancreases is low, patients can actually wait uh, often over a year for their islet transplants. And so we really need to think about ways in which we can make better use of such a scarce resource. So in the major challenges, as I said, are the fact that there is the shortage of organs, but also the fact that this is compounded by the fact that each recipient can need up to three donor pancreases in islet transplantation. Many of the pancreases cannot be used because they've been without oxygen for more than 12 hours and there are no methods to really assess the viability of these sorts of islets that come from these pancreases. Islets um, die when they're transplanted into the liver, which again means that requirements from the patients are high. The lack of blood vessel supply when first transplanted, they're ejected by the immune system, and there's a huge amount of inflammation around the islets after transplantation. Thank you, Shireen. Hello there, my name's Ewan Brown from Heriot Watt University, and I'm going to tell you a little about the technology that we've been applying to improve islet transplant quality. Um, a few years ago, Shireen, John and I had a, um, a meeting and a bit of a discussion about um, islet quality, and uh, it's very clear from what Sharon just told you that the, um, ice, the, the main point is that they, if we can improve the quality and number of islets that are transplanted, uh, we can improve uh, both uh, transplant outcomes and the number of possible transplants that could be carried out. And it may surprise you, but we've um, taken an electrical approach to this problem, and I'm going to explain some of the underlying ideas today. So um, you're probably familiar with the fact that uh, electrical activity of cells is used in clinical measurement. You might be familiar with electroencephalogram that measures brain activity, the electrocardiogram that measures um, cardiac activity, um, then electromyogram that measures muscle activity. These are uh, possible uh, using electrodes outside the body because of the synchronous activity of cells in the uh, tissue, i.e. all of the elect small electrical potentials in the cells add up to a large extracellular potential that can be measured. And it may surprise you to know that the same is true of pancreatic beta cells. So every beta cell, um, shown here on the left, the mechanism in which the beta cell secretes insulin is tied closely to the fact that uh, beta cells detect the glucose concentration and that detection of glucose concentration mm. causes a series of events in the cell that result in a depolarization, increase in calcium and a secretion of insulin. And if we record electrically shown on the right from individual beta cells, you will see that there's this very um, rapid spiking activity appears in the cell in which the membrane potential oscillates rapidly and is dependent on the concentration of extracellular glucose. Uh, and in fact, this activity um, is characteristic of beta cells and it's, um, may, we, it has been possible in the past to measure the activity of ensemble of beta cells. And that's what we've done here in the next slide. So this shows you a human islet in which you measure the ensemble response to glucose from what approximately thought to be around about 1500 beta cells in individual islets and that can be detected electrically so you see here that we've uh, gone from a resting glucose concentration to a high glucose and back again and you can see that there's this spike-like activity in the islet and that can be detected. Um, Interestingly, if we um, then do an experimental manipulation in which we make the uh, islets anoxic, I, we take away the oxygen, um, in other words, to, to, to um, impair their activity, uh, we find that, in fact, they don't respond anymore to glucose. Um, but as you can see, there's a lot of spike-like activity continuously. 
And so uh, these islets are presumably impaired and they are weakly responding to glucose. So we can characterize a second type of islet that we can. Similarly, if we use a drug called butamide that's known to induce electrical activity by depolarizing beta cells, we can also detect this activity at the level of the entire of the whole islet. And um, not only that, but uh, again, glucose um, addition doesn't generate a distinct islet response. In other words, the cells all the cells are already activated and unimpaired. Similarly, um, we also detect islets that, that are electrically silent, and and we're presuming that these are dead or non-functional islets. And so we can calculate proportions of islets on the basis of of these three parameters: so glucose responders electrically active but non-responders to glucose and silent islets. And so the te technology we've been developing is to use these kind of measures to determine the percentage islet quality in a batch of islets. Here's some example from a series of batches of mouse islets. So each one is isolated from an individual pancreas. And under these two treatments, uh, which we just no reason to go into today, but just to show that the uh, there's a high level of variability between enzymatically isolated islet batches, ranging from, say, uh, over 70% active to as, as little as 1% or 2% of active islets. So it shows that we're able to detect differences in, treat, in um, uh, islet quality at the batch level. So what we're doing is um, we've got an electrical activity and glucose stimulation now from islets, which uh, we're developing. The, IEG, which you could describe as an islet electrogram, as a method to sample islets from batches and rapidly detect the proportion showing electrical <clears throat> activity in response to glucose. And this will give a much more quantitative assessment of islet health. Um, it will also know batch quality and that will improve methodologies to isolate cells. So by tweaking the protocols, we perhaps be able to increase the yield of islets from, from pancreases. Investigate also the donations which are more than 12 hours of anoxia and are not currently used in transplant that uh, Shireen described earlier. And overall, the strategy, once it's passed proper scrutiny, should be able to increase the number and quality of islets. So I'd like to like thank you. Um, and um, I believe we're going to be available for questions shortly. And I thank all the members of the team. Uh, at both at the University of Edinburgh, Harriet Watt, and Scottish National Blood Transfusion Service. Thank you.